Hello, hello, and thank you for tuning in and welcome to the IEA's YouTube channel. My name is Alexander Hammond, a policy analyst here at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And today we are hosting another video in a, in a new series of debates, this time looking at the thorny issue of intellectual property rights. Now, one of the most exciting things I find about working in a think tank is you often meet people who would usually consider themselves ideological allies, peers. But on some issues, you find big issues that they completely disagree with each other. And when it comes to intellectual property, that is one of the big issues. Classical liberals tend to see property rights as one of the most important features of a free society. However, for reasons that I'm sure that we'll find out today in this debate, when it comes to intellectual property rights, libertarians and free marketeers of all stripes just can't seem to agree. It's the debate that's gone on for decades, if not centuries. Now, intellectual property can be defined quite broadly, but it's usually considered to be the legal right that provides creators protection for their original work, inventions, developments, artistic works, and, and so on. And usually when we talk about IP, we're referring to copyrights, patents, uh, trade secrets, trademarks. And for some classical liberals, intellectual property and their rights surrounding them uh, just serves as a logical extension of traditional property rights. And they serve as the bedrock for our economic prosperity and innovation and personal freedoms. Whereas for other classical liberals, Intellectual property is just a government conferred right, not a natural one that encourages political rent seeking, restricts liberty and hinders both economic growth and in innovation. So to debate whether IP should exist at all, I'm thrilled to be joined by two fantastic guests. First up, we are delighted to be joined by a dear friend of EIA, the formidable Professor Terence Keeley. Now, Terence is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute in Washington, DC. He formerly served as a vice chancellor at the University of Buckingham, the UK's oldest and premier private university. For many years, Terence lectured in clinical biochemistry at the University of Cambridge, and he is well known for his outspoken opposition to the public funding of science. And we at the IA are very, very lucky to have him sit on our academic advisory council too. Now, I'm not putting words in Terence's mouth, but Terence broadly believes that instead of bringing prosperity and increased innovation, intellectual property rights are in fact theft, and that patents, uh, patents being the type of IP used to prevent an invention being created, sold, or used by another party, are just a downright menace. Terence, welcome to the channel. Thank you. And our next guest, um, who will be making the case for intellectual property uh, rights, that is, not intellectual property in general, um, is back with us in fighting form after his first round debate with Victoria Hewson on the topic of lockdown just a couple of weeks ago. He's the IA's very own head of lifestyle economics and a fan favorite here on our YouTube, uh, Chris Snowden. Now, contrary to Terence's thoughts, Chris believes IP is crucial in providing an incentive for us to create new things useful things that benefit us all. He has previously written, quote, there should be no argument over a basic principle that people should be rewarded for ideas that make the world a better place. And in 2019, I don't know if he was predicting COVID at this point, he said, quote, why spend millions of dollars developing a new medicine or vaccine when it is going to be copied by a rival pharmaceutical company immediately? So that's Chris's thoughts. Chris, welcome to the channel. Nice to be here. So because intellectual property rights is such a big issue, I think it's best to start with incentives. We always hear intellectual property rights are crucial for incentives. Without them, why would we do, why would we create new products? Terence, uh, tell me your thoughts on this. Why are incentives not a key factor when it comes to intellectual property? Um, the whole point of intellectual property in the form of patents is people take them out to stop others doing research. Patents are a way in which you can protect what you've already achieved and you hope that by taking out a patent you won't have to do any more research and you can stop other people doing research. The incentive to do research is very simple. If you don't do research, you go bust. 
it's we are told that we need to give people temporary monopolies in their research because if they don't have those monopolies they're not incentivized to do research it's exactly the other way around people are incentivized to do research because if they don't they will simply go bust and so the answer to the question if someone says to you i'm not going to do research unless i have intellectual property the answer to that statement is fine see how long before you go bust Patents are a hangover from medieval patents when the entire economy was monopolized from salt to soap. And they represent a misunderstanding of private property rights. We all agree in private property rights in goods that are private, but ideas are not private goods. Ideas are what we call contribution goods. They are non-rivalrous, but excludable. And therefore the concept of private property rights in ideas is different from an objective thing like a piece of land. And they are, they survive purely as a typical medieval anti-competitive trick. Um, okay, you've put it very uh, to the point there. And Chris, what do you make of that? Are incentives important in regards to intellectual property rights? If so, where is Terence going wrong? Well, we consider them important when it comes to standard property rights. And I think sometimes people find it more intuitive that if you buy a physical product or if you make a physical product, then that, that belongs to you. And that's some sort of natural right, as it were. Where, whereas, as, as Terence said, you know, an idea is more of a, a sort of ethereal thing, an invention. It's kind of related to a, a, an idea. Yeah, a song, you know, these things are, you know, in, in the ether ready to be snatched by Paul McCartney or what have you. I mean, I think they they are basically the same thing. Um, the property rights are not, in fact, natural. There are tribes of hunter-gatherers who don't believe in property rights. There are, of course, communists who, who have tried to have societies without property rights. They, they don't work terribly well. The reason that we have property rights in the physical sense, um, they're, they're man-made. And they've been around for so long because they serve a very useful purpose, and that is to incentivize hard work and creativity. And if people couldn't keep what they'd made, they wouldn't bother doing it. Exactly the same principle applies to intellectual property. For the most part, if you exclude, um, you know, uh, very rich people who have just chosen to go off and, and, and look at a particular issue, for the most part, uh, people want to, or they need to be paid for what they do. If you're a musician or an author uh, or indeed a, a scientist, for the most part, you will need to hold on to what you've worked for. You've worked for these things for years in many cases. And if someone can just come along and sell your record or uh, reprint your book uh, or indeed just make generic copies of pharmaceuticals, fewer people will do it. I'm not saying no one will do it. There'll always be people who want to strum on a guitar and write songs for their own pleasure, but not as many people will do it. And therefore the, the standard overall will decline. And you make, you make a good point in regards to people just copying other people's inventions the moment they're done. Like Terence, you've written many great books. Um, and your, would your argument therefore mean that the moment you publish your next book, I can quickly buy it, type it up, find a distrib uh, find someone to make it and print it far cheaper than you can and get all that profit that I'm sure would be a lot of money if it was one of your books. Well, there are different forms of intellectual property. Hmm. And I've, I've read Chris's stuff and I've noticed that Chris is very careful which bits of property rights he protects because he's probably right about that things like um, copyright of a book or a, a piece of music uh, where the costs of copying are so much less than the costs of manufacture. He may well be right about that. I'm not going to go into that because that's not really to do with economic growth, which is my area. But I'm prepared to believe he might be right. Equally, he's very careful, I notice, to identify pharmaceuticals as an area where the costs of copying are so much less than the cost of production. But that is an exception uh, and an important exception because the costs of regulation, which are imposed by government, by the way, the costs of regulation are vast. I mean, something like 95% of the cost of a drug is regulation, it's not R&D. Well, under those circumstances, it's very reasonable for government to provide a compensation because there the, co the costs of copying really are very, very small. And therefore it's reasonable for government to issue patents. And indeed, empirically, the evidence is clear 
strong patent rights in pharmaceuticals encourage R&D. But pharmaceuticals is only this exception. If you look at the whole of the rest of the economy, if you look at patents across the economy, in the 19th century, when this issue was really closely divided, you had countries like Switzerland or you had countries like the Netherlands that didn't have intellectual property, didn't have patents, and they did just as well, possibly better, than when they finally introduced them under pressure from Germany, as it happens. The important thing about patents is there's absolutely no empirical evidence that they stimulate r and I'll explain why in a second. But the costs are huge. Muren and Besson wrote a book a few years ago called Patent Failure, pointing out that the cost to the American economy of disputes over patents, we, we talk about billions and billions and billions for no economic benefit. What we want is this. We want companies to constantly be doing more and more R&D against each other to keep up with advances so that we're constantly making new discoveries. We don't want people sitting on their current discoveries for any length of time. The moment they made a discovery, we want them to reinvest the profit, reinvest the profit from that into the next tranche of R&D. That's what we actually want. So we don't want people to have these rights in their ideas because we want them to be developing the next idea. And that's why in practice, there's no empirical evidence. Patents stimulate the economy, but they do cause a great burden on the economy by the cost of legal litigation. Chris, before we move on, do you have any comebacks to that? Well, I think actually I'm being pretty consistent in my defense of intellectual property. I, uh, I accept there's a problem with things like patent trolls and that, you know, the Disney corporations extended these lengths of trademarks and copyright probably for, for too long. And you can argue about exactly uh, how the system should work. But I am fairly consistent in saying there should be a system across the board. Terence is the one now making exceptions for music and pharmaceuticals and books and so on. I mean, in, in the, yeah, 500 years ago, you didn't have the means of mass reproduction, by and large. Um, and musicians starved, or they had very rich patrons, and artists starved or had very rich patrons. But in the modern world, where you can produce lots of copies, uh, you need to have intellectual property. And then, then of course, there's a whole, whole issue of branding, which you kind of mentioned just in your introduction early on. If you don't believe in intellectual property, presumably you think that anyone should just be able to make a Louis Vuitton bag or a, a, a Marlboro cigarettes or whatever it may be. Um, and I think that's a very difficult position uh, to defend. So I would accept that there are areas where people will or need to do the work anyway. I think actually, you know, and Terence knows more about you know, the this science side of this, obviously, than I do. But it seems to me that for a lot of not just pharmaceutical companies, but for you know, scientific companies in general, the incentive, again, is to have protection of your patent for a length of time. And I say we can argue about how long that should be. Um, but if they don't have that, then they are not going to do it or fewer people will do it and there will be less of an incentive to carry on. And that, I think, is true of pretty much any invention that if someone can immediately rip it off, then yes, you have first mover advantage and you can establish yourself as the brand name, but you know, they can very quickly be copied generically and people soon work out that it's not really worth your effort being an inventor and you go off and do something else. Yeah, and to build on on that, uh, Terence, so we're talking about R&D here, but what makes you so sure that without the incentive knowing that they'd be able to have a profit of their um, creation that Pfizer, for example, would have made the COVID vaccine? Would they have just not bothered if they knew they weren't going to make the profit? Or well, even if they made it, there's no guarantee they could have a profit. That's because someone else come along and do it for cheaper. Well, it comes down to something actually that Chris said, um, which is the business of first mover advantage. What we, by the way, there, there are areas where Chris and I are in agreement, but I am more consistent than he gives me credit for. I'm talking primarily from the point of view of science and R&D, which is, which is the growth in the economy. I, I know much about that. I know much less about things like uh, trademarks and copyright. I'm very happy to, to be told by Chris about those areas. But the area that interests me is the most important area, which is that of R&D in, in economic growth. Uh, and in that area, um, it's very clear that First mover advantage is actually not trivial. Um, you probably have about 18 months before your competitors can start to copy what it is you have produced. It depends exactly what industry you're in. And that is about the right length of time for someone to have a temporary monopoly in, in empirical facts, because it gives you time to get your product out onto the market. You have 18 months before the start, 
the first com competition comes along and that provides you with a profit and incentive to make the next piece of R&D. Equally, your competitors, because they know you don't have a monopoly, because they know you don't have a legal protection for 12 or 15 years, they are highly incentivized to do the R&D to catch up with you and copy you. It's a highly benign system. The most important thing is, and pharmaceuticals, and in my world, only pharmaceuticals are the exception, because I'm just talking about scientific R&D, which is the most important form of intellectual property. In that area, pharmaceuticals are the only exception only because of this huge government regulatory burden, which I accept is appropriate under the circumstances. But in all other areas of R&D, um, the short, relatively short first move advantage time of about 18 months is all you need to maximize your own R&D and that of competitors, which is why the most important facts are the empirical facts. No one has ever shown that tightening property rights or conferring property rights on a nation stimulates its rate of economic growth once you look systematically across reasonable periods of time across a reasonable number of nations. All you do is burden that nation with a huge uh, litigation cost. Okay, and, and to follow up on that, Terence, you've mentioned before to me privately um, that there is a big correlation between the growth of, sorry the rate of economic growth in a nation and how strongly they follow the uh, intellectual property and if they completely ignore it or not over history so you, I know you've done work on the industrial revolution for example done um, with lots of people stealing each other's ideas in China their economic growth um, because they don't follow patents very closely at all do you mind talking about that a, a much no well this is an area I'm sure Chris will agree with me by the way um, economic growth is a consequence of ideas. Ideas equals economic growth. It's not more capital. Uh, that was shown as long ago as 1957 by Robert Solow. Economic growth is from the invention and application of new ideas. So the more you can produce new ideas, the faster you can do that, the better. Patents are designed to block new ideas. That's the whole point of patents. So you have a monopoly on that idea. Therefore, no one else is incentivized to try to get into that idea. And you're not incentivized to improve on that idea because you can hope you monopolize the whole industry. I mean, there are examples of this. The, the Wright brothers, for example, between 1903 and 1917, when America went to war, had a monopoly on the airplane in America. And there were no airplanes in America. Until 1917, nobody could fly an airplane in America because the Wright brothers had a monopoly, but they weren't flying either because they spent all their time in court. So when America went to war in 1917, the first thing President Wilson did was impose what's called a patent pool. And patent pools are very, very interesting. They're much more common than people realize. So in 1917, um, President Wilson introduced a patent pool to stop patents in aviation in America. And by the time the pool was abolished for ideological reasons, it shouldn't have been. In 1975, America had the best aviation industry in the world in the complete absence of patents. You have patent pools in sewing machines. The funny thing about patents is the moment they really start to work, the moment people suddenly realize that their patents are blocking competitors and competitors realize that they are being blocked and it starts to become a mutual blocking, people come together and create patent pools. So the irony about patents is that the moment they really work, people get around them with this business of pools. As for China, we shouldn't have intellectual property. In fact, we, there shouldn't be intellectual property at all. Let the Chinese copy us. That's the, that's the way they could get richer. It is for us, because we're better at R&D, we still, although they're catching up, to make the next discovery while the Chinese are three steps behind. It's a much healthier world for us to continue leading intellectually and let the third world copy. Why should they be poor forever? Property rights are particularly cruel when applied to R&D in the third world. So Chris, what do you make of that? We should be kinder to these poorer nations and let them copy our ideas without any repercussions. Well, I'm tempted to let Terence have the scientific R and D side of it, as he's as he's given me everything else. I mean, I think that's a, I'll shake on that really. Um, I don't know because it's so. I mean, I'm trying to think back now to my my you know learning history of the Industrial Revolution and so on. I do seem to recall various patents being lodged for various important things, but perhaps Terence will tell me they uh, they weren't or or they wouldn't have made any difference had that not been available. Um, and I'm sure people like maybe. I don't know, 
Thomas Edison or somebody might have invented the light bulb without having the carrot of the pattern there. I, 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 no, I'm not sure he would have done. I think a lot of these people were in it primarily for the money, but I stand stand to be corrected on that one. I think a, a problem is we don't have the, the counterfactual in a, lot, in a lot of these instances. We're going back a very long time. Um, but it, I would still maintain that until the modern era, a great deal of this kind of creativity and innovation came from rich people with inherited wealth who were playing around with a hobby a lot of the time. And the creation of solid intellectual property gave individuals and businesses a stronger framework in which they had guaranteed returns. And I find it very hard to believe that that wouldn't um, be beneficial in that regard, particularly since, as I think we all seem to agree, it is beneficial when it comes to arts and music and uh, and books. Go ahead, Terence. Yeah, well, um, there are grounds of agreement between Chris and I, which I'm very happy actually to explore. If he's prepared to give me science, which I think is the only intellectual property in which I'm actually competent to talk and know about and think is important, I'm very happy to concede copyrights. I remember Charles, I don't remember personally, but I remember reading about people like Charles Dickens getting very cross when the Americans copied his books without paying royalties. So um, it is science that matters. Now you've talked about two things, the counterfactual. There is a counterfactual. What is really interesting is the counterfactual in the 19th century when countries, and I'm just repeating myself, like the Netherlands and Switzerland, but there were others that didn't have property rights in patents, I mean, in, in R&D. And, and it made no difference at all, absolutely no difference. There are more counterfactuals because the 19th century debate on our property rights was much tighter than we now remember because that was an era of free trade and people believed that property rights in, in patents, I mean, intellectual property in ideas in research were a form of um, protectionism and therefore disapproved of them. So there were counterfactuals in the 19th century, which is so important. Now you talked about another thing called Edison. You're absolutely right about Edison, by the way. Edison had a factory that produced patents that he then licensed to other people to, to, to market. That's the way Edison personally made his money. But if you look at Edison's contribution, I mean, Matt Ridley is very interesting on this. He did, he did invent the light bulb and he patented it one morning in America. That very afternoon, someone else patented it in America. And within a year, I think it's either 17 or 33 other people globally had patented the light bulb. So although Edison had a very good business model, a better business model is what developed consequently where all these big companies and indeed small companies simply did their R&D internally in-house. So I accept your fact about Edison, but it's completely irrelevant to the growth of economics of the American economy or any other form of economy. So to summarize my point, there is empirically no question that increasing intellectual property rights or even conferring them, and we do have the counterfactuals, doesn't stimulate economic growth. Pharmaceuticals is the exception because rightly there's this huge regulatory burden of the government. And if, I, if you will concede that to me, Chris, I'll concede trademarks, copyright and arts to you. Well, I think we have a deal then. We're going to have to, <laughs> going to, have to end this early. No, 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 no. We're not having this. Okay, so Terence, if, if we're allowing pharmaceuticals... Um, to be a free-for-all patent-wise, surely there must be other industries as well. It, it, how can it be philosophically consistent if it's just one single industry that we're allowing this for? Because it is the only industry where the regulatory burden is, is grotesque. I mean, to come back to Chris's earlier point, the cost of copying is very, very important. If 95% of the costs of a new drug are regulation, you know, phase one clinical trials, phase two clinical trials, et cetera, those huge burdens. And yet the copier can simply just copy the original drug and just say, look, there's a regulatory hurdle crossed. Under those circumstances, and I keep on repeating myself, those are the burdens laid down by government and therefore government should reasonably give relief to those. But that is the only exception. The regulatory burden is nothing like that in any other industry. It doesn't even exist like that. And therefore it is reasonable to take pharmaceuticals as an exception. And again, indeed, I would say, look at the empirical evidence. The only industry where it can be shown that patent rights actually stimulate R&D is the pharmaceutical industry because of this very reason of the regulatory burden. In every other industry, and here I disagree with Chris quite sort of firmly, 
the counterfactual is there. We know about countries that take away property. The Dutch took away property rights in the 19th century. The Dutch had a patent system, which they abolished. And then they carried on for many, many years of that one until the Germans, just before the First World War, forced them, because the Germans did believe in intellectual property, uh, to reimpose it. And when you look at what happened to the Netherlands before, during and after, absolutely no difference. Equally Switzerland and other countries as well. Okay, point taken. So, Chris, question for you. What is the difference, or how can we define it legally, the difference between intellectual property rights and normal property rights? Because I saw an article you posted uh, in 2019, I believe it was, where you said intellectual property rights are no more tangible than conventional property rights. But my thinking on if we see property rights and intellectual property rights as similar, and we should treat them similar, similarly, surely this creates a problem because if I buy a house, I don't only have my house for 20 years, I have it for as long as it's a house, but the land on it. So how are intellectual property rights different and how should we define them in that sense? Well, firstly, you might find actually that you only have the land for 99 years. It's not uncommon for the, the land to be effectively rented, but that's a, a side issue. Um, I mean, you're not just patenting ideas. I mean, the ideas turn into something more tangible. You know, the, the musical notes might be hanging in the air, but you then write them down or you sing them or you, you record them in some way and you come up with a, a physical product and the property rights are to stop people copying the physical product similarly with, with writing a book or a poem or, or whatever it may be there is there is usually something tangible at the end of it it's just very very easy um to to copy so it's not as if somebody just come up with an idea it's, you know the theory of relativity wasn't patented or anything like that um you are just stopping people from copying it for, for a period of time um similarly you're stopping people passing off um, a, a product with a particular trademark on it because it's essentially fraud. You're passing off something um, you know, that, 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 that isn't. Um, and I don't, I've, I've discussed intellectual property with people you know, many times, and I've found very few people actually think that there's anything wrong with trademarks and, and that kind of thing and, and, and branding. And again, the Chinese completely ignore all that stuff. And you know, most, of, most of Asia, they sell. Uh, bootleg football strips and so on and, and football clubs in this country would rather they stop doing it whether it benefits economic growth over there I, i'm not sure I, I, I doubt it does so i don't think there's much of an argument for not clamping down on that kind of thing even if you believe that you know mickey mouse is just an idea and somebody drew it and it doesn't really belong to anybody well no i mean uh, uh, at some point it should go out of copyright but not quite yet so you're not just it, they are there are tangible things that you're essentially uh patenting but you're doing it for exactly the same reasons as you protect normal property rights which is that if people can just take your stuff um then why would you create stuff but isn't there an issue then of how do we define it what's the difference between copying someone and inspiration because well, we Go ahead. We, I mean, the way we do it now is basically pretty good. I said, you know, with the exception of you know, pat patent trolls and maybe extending this length of time for too long. I'm not quite sure, for example, why um, the copyright of someone like George Orwell, I think he's, he's out, of, out of copyright this year. But for 70 years after he died, it belo belonged to his estate. I'm not quite sure who's being incentivized by that in particular. It doesn't seem to me obvious that people should have the copyright for their, you know, their, their deceased loved ones whatsoever. So again, we can argue about the, the kind of nuts and bolts and, and uh, the details of this, but the basic principle I think is sound. And Terence, I think has quite possibly come up with uh, an exception to this, but I think it is the exception. I'm not, not hundred percent convinced yet because I don't know enough about it, but I will certainly take, uh, take his, his, his word for it for the time being. Uh, but generally speaking, there is no reason really to think that the basis for property rights, which is to reward innovation and hard work, do not apply to intellectual property and the products of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, sorry. No, go ahead, Terence. I mean, I think the prop, I mean, I think we're, you, you and I are actually reaching a fair consensus here, but what you call the exception is for me, 
easily the most important aspect of intellectual property, which is can a big industry take out a monopoly on a big product, which is going to affect the GDP of millions and millions and millions of people. Um, and, and, and that is the heart of the most important aspect of, of intellectual property. And there is a reason why that would be different from property rights in a, in a, in a pen. So for example, this pen, and I'm using um, economist language, it's non-rival, it's rivalrous and excludable. But all that that means is that this is a private good and I can keep it. But the idea of a pen is an idea that can be used by trillions of people. And the more people who use the idea of a pen, the better for everyone, because you get more pens on the market and better pens as people research it. So the idea of extrapolating from property rights in land or a pen to property rights in ideas is I think a category error. Ideas are not the same as private goods. They're definitely not private goods. They have this capacity to be used by everybody indefinitely without diminishing uh, those ideas. What we want, and I'm sort of coming back to a point that I made earlier, but since around 1650, certainly since 1750, the British economy has grown by about 2% a year every year. Ever since then, the same is true of America, Germany, France. During the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution took off. And it happened because idea after idea was created and then superseded by competition. That's the nature of economic growth. We don't want to freeze these ideas in aspic so that we stop competition. The moment an idea comes out, we want that to stimulate more ideas. And what patents do is they inhibit, that's the whole point of patents, they inhibit other people from bypassing and exploiting your idea to produce the next idea, and they enable you to hide behind a monopoly. If your idea is any good, you will make money on it, and you then reinvest that money in R&D for the next idea. What we want is more and more R&D, and the whole point of patents is they're trying to stop people from doing R&D. Patents actually are a bad thing. Chris, do you have a comeback at all? Or should we move well, on? Well, I mean, st st still, I mean, that's quite a good example. The, so the Biro there. Now, I don't know the history of the Biro. I assume it was patented by somebody. It did change the world in a, in a, in a modest kind of way. And now uh, people, can, people can copy it. I assume they don't... Um, pay any money to the makers of Biro. I'm not even sure Biro were the first people to make a Biro. I'm assuming it was. I'm uh, flying by the seat of my pants here a little bit, but it doesn't matter because it's the, it's the example, you know. So yeah, it's the idea of the Biro that is valuable in the same way that the idea of Harry Potter is valuable. Um, but if somebody then wants to go off and write another Harry Potter book uh, and pass it off as, well, as, as JK Rowling's, let alone as, as uh, themselves, I don't think that's a very good thing. And I think it's a good thing that J.K. Rowling has got very rich by coming up with an idea that has appealed to millions and millions of people around the world. Um, so J.K. Rowling has been rewarded for her art and her, her, her work and her imagination, uh, despite the fact that the idea of a, a little wizard at school is, is non-rivalrous and so on. But... If Terence had his way, the inventor of the Biro would be not totally unrewarded, but possibly rewarded only for a very short period of time until somebody came up with a better advertising campaign or a better logo. And that does seem to me a bit dicey and potentially unfair. And as a result of that, potentially leading to other people who might be minded to come up with an idea as good as a biro and spend the amount of time and possibly money that is required to come up with that kind of invention uh, might give them reason to think twice about doing it themselves. Let me respond to that very good point, um, because these aren't stupid points. By the way, I believe, I'm not an expert on the biro either, but I believe biro is named after an individual. I think he was a Hungarian called biro. Let's pretend Mr. Biro could actually monopolize Barrows indefinitely. He'd have sold the first tranche of Barrows and he'd have had no incentive in improving those Barrows because he had a monopoly on the idea of a ballpoint pen. That's what it is, is a ballpoint pen. Whereas what we've actually had is hundreds and hundreds of people coming in and making competitive Barrows and the whole Barrow world is much better than had it been monopolized by Mr. Barrow. And we have examples of this in history, like for example, the Wright brothers and the airplane. Once patents really work, they crush the industry. It gets stuck perpetually in one mold. So you're absolutely right. But, and here is the big difference, and I'm, you're making some very interesting points, Chris. Here is the big difference. Creativity in research and development is not rare. Good researchers are relatively rare. Nonetheless, 
within that community of good researchers, it's not difficult to come up with the next new idea. It's a race. Edison only beat his competitor to come to one of your earlier examples, the light bulb, by a few hours. So the idea that Barrow's idea, Mr. Barrow's idea was particularly special and need to be treasured. The idea that creativity in R&D needs to be protected, I'm afraid isn't true. Because actually, if you look, and Matt Ridley's very good on this, by the way, if you look across the piece, simultaneous invention, simultaneous invention is the norm. It is normal for lots and lots of different people at the same time to make the next invention, because actually the inventions speak for themselves. Once you've got A and B and C, D practically screams, actually, this is the way to go. The light bulb, for example, it was just a matter of trying to work out what filament would not burn in a vacuum. It was just a matter of testing and testing and testing until you came up with it. So invention in technology is to a penny. We don't need to treasure Here's a cruelty for you. We don't need to treasure inventors and technology. I'm afraid they're to a penny, which is why all the IT inventors are of a particular generation, because that was a technology that came of a certain type and some, some people were selected and others not. We don't have to worry about IT technologists. Unfortunately, they're to a penny. But wasn't the, the in, going back to the case, case of the light bulb, isn't it precisely because there was a huge pot of gold at the end of the rainbow there that people were racing so feverishly and quickly to get it invented and, and, and therefore patented? Yeah, well, they, they took advantage of the patent system because it was there. But had there not been a patent system, they would have still been the incentive to develop a new light bulb. The institutional structure would have been different. There'd have been fewer people like Edison with standalone labs whose function was to produce patents that you then license and those inventors would have been working within existing industries or creating specific industries like Swan in Newcastle, specifically for the purpose of growing a company in that area. So without patents, the institutions would be different. The R&D would take place much more within companies rather than within standalone IT generating license bodies. Edison's the exception throughout, by the way, is a very unusual system. But the incentive to produce a light bulb and to develop a better mousetrap is always there you're not trying to monopolize the whole industry, by the way. You're just trying to get a better return on your investment in R&D than if you invested in marketing or advertising or something. In, the extraordinary thing about R&D is that a handful of people do make huge profits. The vast majority of R&D inventors actually make surprisingly modest invent, uh, report, profits, which is actually how it should be. R&D in industry is much less special than we all think. Right. So... Changing the topic slightly, if we look forward to the future, what the future holds for intellectual property, are you quite optimistic about the outlook, Terence? Or do you, think, do you think the things are going to get worse? Patents are going to be extended. Um, there'll be even more barriers for people wanting to develop things and various regulations. Or do you think some technologies like 3D printing, for example, will make enforcing uh, intellectual property rights even harder? Well, I'm, I mean, in many areas, I'm very optimistic, by the way. I mean, I, I've i written a lot to say that the government funding of science, which is my hate, you know, I, I think the government funding of science is a very, very bad thing. We live in extraordinarily benign times. Uh, the amount of money that governments spend on science now is about a third or even a quarter relative to GDP than it was three, four, decades ago. In some areas, things are much, much more benign. But I'm depressed about intellectual property. I think the Chris Snowdens of this world are winning the debate, I think, unfortunately so. And we're living in a world increasingly, as the Trump era showed particularly, where the power of major industrialists seems to grow all the time. As the world becomes, I'm not making some sort of left-wing liberal point, I'm just describing the world as it is. As the world becomes more and more unequal with more and more power in the hands of the big chief executives of the very big companies, and those companies are focused on, well, chief executive reward, so those who own the means of production, sorry to use that term, those who own and control the means of production develop more and more power to organize the market around their interests. Patents are in the interests of existing patent holders. Patents are in the interest of companies 
that have already portfolios of 1,000, 2,000 patents. That's what big companies do. They build up this huge portfolio of patents and stop new entrants trying to get in. That's what they do. That's why at the moment, by the way, in IT, we have these extraordinary monopolies. Five monopolistic companies seem to hold the control the entire internet. And one of the ways Facebook et al. have managed to have that huge monopoly power is they've used the patent laws to entrench their monopoly powers. If you believe, as I believe, that it's very unhealthy that five chief executives of five big companies in America control freedom of speech across the globe, one of the reasons is that they have each a monopoly in their niche because of their patent powers, and they're not going to give that up. And the whole of the controversy with China, it's extraordinary to hear these extraordinarily rich corporations in America complain bitterly about how they've been impoverished by China copying their patents. It's all about vested interests trying to cling on to their wealth rather than think of ways in which society as a whole could be enriched. But that's what companies have done from day one. We at the IAA are not corporate shills. We're not interested in the interests of big companies. We at the IAA are interested in the benefits to society of a free market. And the whole point of patents is there a trick by rich people to try to make the market less free. So Chris, are patents a trick and are you optimistic about the future and what it holds for intellectual property? Uh, not particularly, no. And I'm not, I won't talk about science. I'll talk about some of the other stuff because I don't have to play this entire debate on, on Terence's turf. Uh, but if you take music, it's pretty obvious to anybody who follows popular music that the last 20 years have seen an enormous tail off in originality and creativity. And the, the record companies are not putting the money into new bands are not really looking for new bands. The whole thing is just a merry-go-round of increasingly aged rockers playing live gigs to um, people who are prepared to pay a lot of money for it. And there's there's very few decent new bands coming through. And I don't think that's because younger people have got less creativity than they used to have. I think it's because the investment isn't there and the incentive isn't there. Um, you, you are, if you form a band these days, you are going to put it out for free. You're going to put your music out uh, for free and you're going to hope to make some kind of money by gigging live, which obviously at the moment is a complete non-starter, but it doesn't make a lot of money um, even when people are allowed out, out of the house. So um, I think we have a pretty good case in point there of what happens when intellectual property is violated. I'm talking, of course, by about people ripping off MP3s on the internet. It's quite conceivable a very similar thing will happen with television and film. Uh, Hollywood is already going downhill, just endless uh, sequels. They try and put a lot of 3D films out there because that actually gets people physically into the cinema rather than ripping off uh, copies on uh, torrents. No one has yet really found a good way of ripping off books, but I'm sure as soon as that technology is there, people will stop buying books and start reading them as PDFs ripped off um, from the internet. You contrast that, by the way, with something like video games, which is a really booming sector, because there, no one's really got got around the IP on, on video games. And so companies are still charging 30, 40, 50 pounds for a game because you can't rip them off on the internet. So we can see in, across various different sectors, outside of science, um, where actually the, 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 you know, the, the basic theory and process that I've outlined today that if you don't get rewarded for producing things you won't produce things and so you're left with in the case of music basically a few uh rich kids who are you know, messing around for a few years and strumming a guitar we haven't got the incentives there and with, with trademarks looking around the world you know china is ripping off these trademarks left right and center and i'm not particularly worried about the the profits at, at louis vuitton or nike or what have you but you know, brands are there to be the consumer's guarantee right the, the importance about brands is that companies put a huge amount of money into building a brand advertising it and having built that brand they need to maintain the quality and so people buy brands because they know that this is not a fly-by-night company, that they are going to produce something of pretty good quality. And as soon as these trademarks are ripped off all over the world, the consumer doesn't know where he or she is. Um, so these things are actually have great value to the consumers as well as to uh, businesses. I will grant that there are, of course, exceptions, just as Terence has granted uh, my exceptions. But by and large, I still maintain at the end of this debate that the argument for... 
intellectual property is very similar and as strong as the argument for standard conventional property rights, as it were. Amazing. So we've come to an agreement of sorts, not entirely, but a lot of concessions were made on both sides. So Terence, Chris, thank you so much for joining us.